Hello, everyone, and welcome to my webinar with Thank You on the topic An Introduction to Outdoor and Self Photography. I hope everyone is doing good in these days. And yeah, let's go into it. And always remember that you can always ask a lot of questions at the end of the presentation. You just type it into the chat and I am do my best to ask them later on. And now for the presentation, I'm going to turn off the, the camera and we will see how this is going. <laughs> All right. So, so let's talk a little bit about me. Maybe you know some of my images, maybe you have never heard about me, but that's me on the photo. And I lived and grew up in Austria and was always interested in all kinds of sports. And at that time, years ago, I was a semi-professional snowboarder. And I guess that was the time when I really felt in love with the outdoors. And one day I hurt my knee and wasn't able to ride anymore. That was when I picked up an old film SLR camera from my granddad, actually, and started shooting my friends riding. So I wasn't able to ride and jump in the kickers. So I was just yeah, taking images of my friends. And that's where, where all, the, all the things started. I really became interested in all kinds of photography genres. And here we go today. Now, over 10 years, I work as a professional photographer, mainly focused in the outdoor industry. And mostly my photography has something to do with landscape, adventure, traveling, or with sports. If you haven't seen any of my work, feel free to head over to my Instagram or just check out my website when the presentation is over. But yeah, be warned, my website, I haven't updated it since, since a few years, but yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next slide. What we will cover today. I will talk about what I think are some outdoor photography fundamentals. Then we go over my photo equipment, what I use and what I can recommend and why I use it. And because on Instagram, many people ask me a lot about outdoor gear, I will just show a few, yeah, a few things I use in the mountains or just outdoors. And then we go further to how I shoot my images when there is like motion, sports, or surf involved. And last but not least, I'm gonna show you my experience with the latest 4K monitor, thank you, the SW321C. All right, and then sure, you have, we have some time to go over your questions. Outdoor photography fundamentals. I don't want to talk too much about the technical side of photography because you will find a ton of that stuff on YouTube anyway. So what is outdoor photography today? To me, this is a mix of at least four genres, which are landscape, adventure, sports, and people. And yes, I also think people are really important because without people, there are hardly ever any stories to tell. And that's actually, that's actually what we want to do with our images, right? You want to tell a story. You want, you want other people, like you move them to, to show what you have done and maybe inspire them with a good story. <coughs> oh, I have to, sorry. <laughs> that was too fast, but yeah. It's actually what you want to do. You want to have good stories with your images. And this brings me to the next point. There is that saying that if you want to tell a good story, you have to live a good story. And so you are part of the story. You need to be an active participant. And I think this is really important with outdoor photography. That's why outdoor photography for me is not like, how do you say? It's not a sideline sport. You, you cannot just sit there and taking pictures from the sideline. You need to emerge in it. And you need to be an active participant. 
because if you're active in a sport, you are going to shoot, and sure, you, this will lead to better images because you know how the athlete will perform because you are a sports athlete by yourself. So I'm really convinced by that. You got to know the sport and often predict what the athlete will do next. So and especially with surfing, this is crucial because often in surfing, especially in the water, you often have to predict where the surfer will go next. But yeah, more on that later. I would say if I look at outdoor images, I can immediately tell if the photographer was part of the story. Those images just look a little bit different than those shot from the sideline. <clears throat> and as so often, with outdoor photography, it comes down to right place, right time. What do I mean by that? I mean that it is crucial for you to put yourself out there when the magic happens. Because then it is almost easy to get good images. I mean, imagine being on a mountaintop for sunrise. I bet even images taken with a phone look great then. So do your research first. Use, use the apps out there like photo fields, use Google Maps and also ask around in your network. I often ask around in my network on, on location tips and just yeah, use or use Instagram, for example, private messages and ask people if they have like a tip. I have to go there, I shoot a campaign there and I need some yeah, location tips and some are happy to share, some are not, but often yeah, better ask than sorry. <laughs> What's important to like, it's always be prepared. That's what really important because you have to know your gear, bring those extra batteries, bring those extra memory cards and don't forget the down jacket can be very cold up there. It's just way more easier to concentrate on the images, on the, taking the images when you're prepared well. And yes, I mean, sunset and sunrise are probably the best times to shoot landscapes or also adventure images. But I wouldn't reduce myself just on that time of the day because especially when you have bad weather or when it gets stormy or you get some really, yeah, if, if shit comes down, I think you get the really authentic images. Those images often have a really special vibe in them. And I would even say that they have more emotions in those shots. So I will explain that a little bit later. I will try to explain what I mean by that. And last but not least, if you really want to do that job, if you really want to become like an auto photographer and do this as a business, you have to realize that it's not just about the outdoors. You have to do the office work. It's just part of the whole game. Be aware that you have to deal with all the mundane things every freelancer has to deal with. Because me, most of my time, I spend in the office trying to get the next assignment, actually. The actual amount of time I spend shooting images is quite small compared to what I, yeah, to compared to how much time I spend on, on keeping the business running. While I do have some serious adventures during the year, yeah, but most of the time I spend dealing with taxes, tons of emailing, talking to clients, editing images, setting up the next shoot or dealing with logistics for the next shoot. These are just a few things that happen on a daily basis in my office. So remember, even if Instagram just shows you the outdoor moments, be aware that every photo photographer who wants to make this a career has to deal with other things too. Yes, and if you have like every any questions about that, just type them into the chat. All right. Now, Surf 2016. Um, one second. So, before I'm gonna talk about my equipment, I want to show you some of my images I took on that trip because I think it shows really good when I say you have to be part of the story that 
the trip was just, I was in the middle of the story actually. And this was not a job, this was a trip with my friends. But because of many people saw these images online, I got a job later on. And yeah, and some of the images also ended up printed in a book about adventure photography. So if you do like free stuff in your in your spare time, it doesn't mean that you can't monetize it later on. So rule number one, always bring an adventurous looking car. <laughs> no, not really, but it, it really helps. <laughs> Luckily, my friend Felix got this Toyota car just before the trip. He was doing a huge trip around the Baltic Sea and I, I was meeting him in Helsinki with the goal to find some surf vapor waves in Finland. But we haven't been successful with that and the forecast looked really bad. So we decided to drive up north with, yeah, north all the way from Helsinki to the Lofoten Islands, which is like eight to 10 hour drive. And we did arrive in the middle of the night. And in the next morning, we just saw there's fresh snow in the mountains and the waves are coming in. So every, everyone was so ready to finally jump into the ocean for some waves. Imagine that after like 10 hours in the car, and three hours of sleep. <laughs> I often went in last because I wanted to capture the others getting ready and riding their first waves. So that's also a shot from this trip. And yeah, that was shot after the first session. Uh, yeah, because it, at the first session it started snowing. And for me, this was the first time that I, I saw snow on a beach. And I just loved the whole scenery. So this photo is one of my favorites. And you can see our cars, the tent, and this huge mountain in the back. Behind me is the ocean. And I love this shot so much because it stands for the whole trip, for the whole adventure. And it also is a perfect example that it is important to take images when the weather is bad and not just on sunrise or sunset. Next shot. We'll show my friend Felix on the way. Um, yeah, it's not the biggest wave, sure, it's it's not at all, and it's not the best turn or anything, but again, it's a photo where I think it transports the feeling and the emotions very well. And I think this is so important with storytelling these days. It's more about how can you transport a, a feeling with your images rather than always get the best, sickest shots of the best, biggest wave or anything like that. Here, a little selfie of me in the water. I was shooting here with a little compact camera in the water, water housing. But yeah, more on, on the gear later. And the water had around five degrees Celsius. And we were wearing five to six millimeter wetsuits. And I wasn't used to these temperatures and froze my ass off on every session. But every time I saw the images, I was super happy about it later. <laughs> the cool thing with surfing in cold water definitely is that you have all the waves for yourself. We didn't meet any people around there. And as you can imagine, a wetsuit, a wet wetsuit won't dry. So you have to overcome yourself every day to get back into that freezing cold wetsuit. But this is just part of the game. Often we cooked some water and put the warm water into the booties and into the gloves first. And yeah, this really helped. <laughs> on, your, on your next trip, I would suggest also try to yeah, capture those moments, those little moments in between. The getting ready or like other details of your gear or if people just watch out for like any anything interesting just because those images together with your like best landscape shots and your best extra shots 
then they will tell the whole story. So just imagine you, you shoot for like a book and not, not just for Instagram. That's, that's the thing, I guess. But luckily, yeah, it wasn't just bad weather. We had a few sessions in the sun too, and this was nice, but unfortunately the water, the temperature of the water didn't change. So it was, was warmer outside than inside of the water. So especially I had to overcome myself again and again. I mean, I am a landlocked surfer from Austria and my friends coming from the from northern Germany, they are kind of used to these temperatures because they surf on their home spots in the Baltic Sea a lot, also during winter. But yeah, to me, it was the first time in the cold water. And one more photo from our base camp. I was climbing on a bus to get another angle. And yeah, it shows just where we stayed for like about 10 days. No warm showers, just, yeah. Two people in the tent, two people in the bus, and lots of fun. And on the right, yeah, that's the face surfer makes when they get a vanilla yogurt after a surf session. <laughs> so after telling a good story uh, with images, I think it's super important to try to, to develop your style and stick with it. Then the results will always follow when you work on your own. The best case would be that if people see a photograph, they immediately immediately know that you took it. That would be the best case. Sure, that's not easy, and sure, it takes time, but it's worth trying. It, it is the style of your images that will become your personal brand too. So I would suggest try to develop your own style and, and skip all the short thinking brands on social media. So a good image is, to me, yeah, four things are really important for better outdoor images. Composition and framing is super important. So the first image, um, yeah, the first, when the four P, uh, the first image is a mountain in Amadablam in Nepal. And I took this shot in 2016. And this was shortly before the sunset. And I took this image with the, a tele lens, it was a 70-204. And I like to shoot with tele lenses in the mountains because I can really work on my composition with them. And I can keep, keep, keep things out of my frame, which makes the image more of a minimalistic style. And on this shot, I really like how the clouds wrap around the mountain. Also, the soft light coming from the right side helps to make yeah, this shot work. Then it's super important to, to get some depth into your images when, when it's possible. I know that's not always easy to do, but we can always try. So on the top right, you see my friend Stefan in the Alps. And behind him, there's the iconic Matterhorn in the background. This was a mountaineering trip. And this photo was shot on a wide angle lens where usually everything is sharp. But by moving the lens as close as possible towards the rock, I was able to get some kind of blur rocky foreground, which gives me some depth. When you are on a mountaineering trip, like here in Switzerland, there is just no time to ask your model to move for your shots, like run over there or go over there. Because the faster you are, the safer you are. This was like, yeah, this was pre-sunrise, early in the morning and shot in high ISO, I guess. So, yeah, it's, it's my job to work with what's there and trying to make it interesting as possible. On the lower left side is an example where contrast is a huge part of the image. This is a glacier river in Iceland shot from an airplane, like a really small airplane for like two or three people maximum. And here I think the bright river against the dark sandbars really makes this shot. And when I look at the image with the orca in it, I have to say there are actually five points and not just the four I have listed here. Because with outdoor photography, often 
you have to leave your comfort zone too because yeah if you leave your comfort zone mostly that yeah it's something and it will bring you better images this was two years ago when i was snorkeling and free diving with orcas and pantek whales in norway it was probably my most intense shooting experience ever and there was no cage or anything we were just in the wild with the animals and the first time an orca is looking at you and checking you out you get like really nervous but it's also the most yeah beautiful thing <laughs> to just most peaceful thing to be in the water with these giants and yeah feel safe around them that's that's what really it is um yeah can't wait to go back there and shoot more images with these animals it wasn't isn't possible during the COVID-19 situation now because otherwise I would be there right now because they'll have their workers from November to February up there but yeah they will come back next year again so yeah leave your comfort zone and invest in yourself sometimes you have really have to invest like real money so because this costs money sure flying over rivers costs money and doing a trip to orcas costs money but this will bring you back like really special images and you can build your portfolio and we all know that a good portfolio will bring good jobs so that's my recommendation here leave your comfort zone and go all right now let's talk a little bit about equipment so as a working professional, I'm interested in what is coming out and how it might help me in the future. But the reality these days is that all digital cameras from the last three years or four years are quite mature. This might be an issue for camera companies in terms of selling cameras, but for photographers, the limiting factor is imagination, creativity, and just getting out there and working hard to create new images. It is important that you know that the more gear doesn't equal better images. It just means you have more gear to carry around. I have bought a lot of gear over the last years and a lot of it didn't change my world like I thought it would, so I sold it later. So if you have a decent camera, get over the gear and concentrate on the images. Put a lot of thought into what you want to create and what you want your images to look like and you will become a massively better photographer. So simplify the gear, concentrate on the image. Good photography has more to do with the person behind the camera than the camera itself. That's what I think, yes. All right, let's go to the next slide. So what specifically do I use? Right now, the Sony Alpha 7 R3 is still my main camera. It can do everything for me, so it has a full frame sensor, 42 megapixels, although I can every shooting shoot with it. It has focus, which is fast enough for most sports, not everything. And the IIF, like, yeah, the outer focus, which always focuses on the eyes of people, makes my life sometimes way, way easier when I have to shoot with people when we shoot campaigns and stuff like that and with 10 frames per second it's also great for sports and can shoot decent video yeah high ease of performance pretty nice what do i miss about the camera sure the autofocus can always be fast and more accurate so i think when sony is coming out with the a9 3 i will update this yeah keep it as a backup now there, I have another backup, the Sony AR, uh, AR7 R Mark II, it's not shown here. Yeah. But jobs always bring two bodies, of course, but when I just head out by myself, I go with this one. And then right to it, you see a, so a small Sony, the, the RX4. I think they have already the RX Mark 7 out, but all of them, I would say all of them from three to four, five, six, they're all awesome cameras because you can go and with them everywhere i love this one for a quick hike or just a multi-pitch climb 
and the quality for the size is actually outstanding. Uh, also, like this was the camera I brought on that surf trip in the show at the beginning, and all the images in the water were taken with this one. You can also shoot video with it. It's, it's just an all-around great little tool. Has the best optical image stabilization in a camera I have ever seen, actually. So if you're out in the market for a small compact, I can highly recommend the RX100 series from Sony. All right, lenses. You see I have a ton of lenses here, but I never bring all of them. So very, very rarely I pack all of them because usually I try to limit myself to a maximum of three lenses or less. And especially for mountain projects where every pound counts, I try to go as light as possible. So my go-to lens always will be the 24-70. So this guy can handle everything. It's, it's a great option if you want to go with just one lens, but have to document an event or something. And it's great to shoot lifestyle work too. And I have the 16-35 millimeters thread next to it. I shoot a lot of landscapes with it or when I'm tied in on the rope on a climb where I cannot move like further away from my subject, it's great to have like a really wide lens. It's very versatile too because at 35 I can also shoot portraits with it. And it, it's great to know that even at 2.8, like with an open aperture, it's sharp in yeah, all across the frame. Then on the left side, there is the 7200 f4. This is my go-to tele lens. I opt for the f4 over the 2.8 because it's just lighter and outside most of the time I don't need the 2.8. And if possible, I always bring this lens to the mountains. It's such a light lens for a 200 and it helps me better with compositions and it does a great job compressing the landscapes, which is often very handy in the mountains. Then left side, you see the 100 to 400. Yeah, I always use this one if I need more than 200, but honestly, I use it less, really, because it's just large and heavy. But for this, what it is, it's light and compact. So I think you cannot make a 200, uh, uh, I think you cannot make a 400 millimeter lens smaller like this one is. The quality is outstanding and actually can't wait for my next surf trip where I don't have to hike up a mountain and shoot a lot with it. All right, what else do we have here? It's the, the prime lens, the 24 1.4 on the right side. Yeah, it's light, it's small, it's versatile. I use this one especially when it gets really dark. It has very smooth bokeh and it's also great for video. And a wide open aperture often gives you a very unique look, especially with a wide angle lens like this one. I will show you an example a little bit later. Then not pictured is a yeah, 85, 1.8, which is like perfect portrait lens, but also nice to have to shoot in the water. Super light lens too. And then they're shown like, yeah, two tripods, a bigger one, a smaller one, both are built out of carbon, carbon fiber, so they are really light. And I don't bring that very often, just if I really know I need them. So if I want to shoot stars overnight or something like that. All right. Then what's not pictured is the filters. Yeah, I have B and W and different filters. So I have a set of NDs, which is often right nice to do long exposures or for video work when you have want to have to shut up not like not over 150 and sure i have a circular polarizer whenever i want to get rid of glare or reflections and my to go or go to camera bag is the neo evo your 60c uh, i have no image here but if you google it it's for me the best venture backpack out there, photo. I know everybody's using f-stop, but I use every f-stop and I don't know, I, I like this one better. But 
sure it depends on the activity because sometimes when i go into the mountains i cannot even bring a like photo backpack you need like a real mountain pack for ski touring or for like mountaineering and then i just throw my camera gear in there yeah sometimes with nothing <laughs> mostly just the camera one and another lens yes so now let's go over some image examples all of these images I show you now are shot with the equipment I just showed you. And here, this was shot with my, yeah, 2470. I always try to keep the ISO low for better image quality, but you always have to find a balance between shutter speed and ISO, especially when you shoot people in motion. Because when people are in motion, you usually need like a, a higher shutter speed or a shorter shutter speed. So this is sure it's different with landscapes where you can just lay down the camera or put it on a tripod. But yeah, if you guys are moving, you can you can just ask him to go really slow sometimes. But usually if you shoot like an event or something, you cannot ask him to go slow. Um of course, but Always remember that, I mean, don't be afraid to push your eyes though on the camera, especially if you bought one in the last three years, they're really good. And I really have to say that it's better to have a, a good exposed image in, on a high ISO than a really underexposed image in low ISO. Because when you, in post-production, like try to, yeah, try to um, get back some information in dark areas, you really bring out the noise in the image. So it's way better to shoot in high ISO and make it darker later, and then you have much less noise in images. All right, let's go to the next slide. Um, yeah, like I said, the 7200 f.4 is, I always try to bring it into the mountains because I find better compositions with it. This shot was yeah, taken at f5 because like every lens out there is, has the best quality when you stop it down one or two stops. So I know that my tele perms, uh, yeah, performs best with like f5 or 5.6. That's the, the magic point where I get yeah, the sharpest images. And yeah, another shot with the tele lens here, I was able to compress the image, which makes the mountain in the background a bit bigger than they actually are. And yeah, that's a pretty cool effect in the mountains. <laughs> this was shot in Norway mm, last summer, yeah. And I often use this lens, like as, um, now we talk about the 1635, I often use it if I cannot move further away from my subject but I want to include as much as possible. And here I was limited by nature. And if I would like, I would have fallen down the cliff if I, if I would have moved more further back. So I had to work with what's there. Um, this was shot at, yeah, 3.5, just to get like some depth and with the foreground. Yeah, just trying to make the shot more interesting and get a little framing that I often try to do that. And yeah, same scenario. Um, the mountain I'm standing on was just too close to the mountain in the image. So it was impossible for me to, to go anywhere else than there where I was standing. <laughs> Not many people have been up there, I have to say. This was why they climbed, hiked, mixed adventure but I think it was worth it. So often it's impossible to get a scene into the frame with, with a standard lens and then when a really wide lens makes sense. Sure, you can always take more images and stitch, but I'm, I'm a huge fan of just getting everything ready in camera. All right. And here, for example, I wanted to have the, most of the image sharp. That's why I went for an aperture of f8 and was focusing on the skiers. 
this was also very tight space and not much room left. It was last winter in the Kaiser Mountains in Austria. And yeah, it was just on a full day out hiking and skiing adventure. So that's the first shot taken with a yeah, 400 millimeter tele, but at 336 millimeters. I also, like I said, I shot at 6.3 to get the best quality. I have an ISO of 600, 640, which is like, yeah, like nothing. Super clean image. Um, yeah, this was not shot high on a mountain. Like I said, I don't bring it much when I really go on a mission. But if you have the lens with you, it brings a lot of possibilities with the longer reach. Like here, for example, this was like 2018. We had such an, a huge amount of snowfall in Austria that all the resorts and everything was closed because of avalanche, the avalanche danger. And it snowed, yeah, like a ton in just five days. But when the bad weather uh, went away and it cleared up, I wanted to take photos of this place with all the snow on there because it never lasts really long. And yeah, the only option I had was like a really long lens. And this was actually shot from the valley, which yeah, just like, <laughs> I would say 50 minutes from my apartment. Yeah, I mean, you cannot do this if you have like a 7200 or just a standard lens. It opens up some possibilities. And here is my, Friend Chris, look, still looking pretty tired. We spent the night on the mountain here, somewhere in the Dolomites. And yeah, both images were shot with the prime lens, the 24 millimeter at 1.4. And like I said before, I really like that you can get, uh, how do you say, a quite unique look, because usually when you shoot wide, everything is sharp, but with a wide and super fast aperture lens, you can get, so special images like this i mean you on the right side on the left side you you would see that better if the image would be like a bit bigger but yeah it's it's just another option to um yeah put your work a little bit apart from the crowd then two more images i have shot with the little compact i showed you here i went on a sailing trip to Croatia and yeah I have a cheap housing for the little camera from a company which is called Sea Frogs and at that time when I bought it they were just doing dive housings and they really evolved and now they do like really good surf housings too and they have housings for a lot of brands right now and for a lot of camera models so I can really recommend them because they are almost half the price of all the other brands out there. And next image. Yeah, a super example for right time, right place. Because then open it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't matter which camera I have with you when the light is on and, and you're in a good place on top of a mountain. This was also shot with my compact camera. Yeah, it was a personal climbing, climbing adventure and not the official shooting, so I often just bring my compact camera on days like this. This is another shot from, yeah, it was actually just two months ago or just one month ago. Now it's everything full of snow there. We went on a climbing adventure and yeah, this is just the last few meters to the top. All right. So what's next? Outdoor gear. Yeah, like I said, often I get asked about gear I use in the outdoors. But yeah, the outdoor gear heavily depends on the activity. So sometimes if it's climbing gear, sometimes if it's surfing gear or underwater equipment. And of course, always I need outdoor clothing to choose a water bottle. So here I want to break down what I would bring on a adventure in the mountain today. Uh, of course, everything gets updated if it has to, but additional to my photo kit, that would be 
that would be my basic kit. So I always bring a headlamp. I, I own those two, the LED Lancer and the Lupine Pico. They're really good and last a long time, especially the, the Pico is the best lamp I have ever used. It can really make your, your night today, especially when you have to, I don't know, like riding down a mountain, a mountain bike in the dark. It's no problem with this one. Then what shoes do I use? I'm a friend now from Lower Cut Shoes. And this is the Handwerk Ferrata Low. I really like this one because it has best, yeah, best, how do you say, climbing, hiking mix shoe for me. It's good stability and good hiking performance. I have, I do have high cut shoes too for bigger mountain projects, but for most of the hikes and, and small climb hike adventures, this is the perfect shoe for me. And I always bring, I always bring like a rain jacket and a down jacket. I work with Hagler since like, I don't know, seven, eight years now. And these are the products I use since day one. I never changed those. The, especially the down jacket is super light. You back it up and you just have it. it it's the lifesaver sometimes. Especially when you like on the mountain and you have to wait for an athlete or you have to wait for better weather conditions. A down jacket can save your life. And then I always bring snacks and water. And I just recently switched to those flexible bottles, which I really like because they are super lightweight and you can twist them and collapse them down to like almost no size at all anymore. And it's very, they minimize the space it takes up in your bag. So I can highly recommend these snacks. Yeah, whatever you want. I always go for like granola bars. <laughs> um, not shown some, yeah, beanies, sunglasses, gloves, all the basic stuff actually. For it, yeah, that's for a day adventure. If you want to sleep up there, I that's usually the gear I bring. BB bag, a mattress, one of those two, not um, not both actually. Depends if I lie on rocks or just have like more of a grassy, yeah, grassy on the ground, if you say it like that. And a sleeping bag. And sure, the sleeping bag, this one is a summer sleeping bag from Harkless. And I often use now, I wouldn't use this one. It's way too cold now. I would go for like a minus 10 degree sleeping bag if I have to sleep in the mountain now. Yeah. Um, actually, we almost never bring a tent because it's just too heavy. But sure, you've got to check the, the weather forecast first. But often, also, if it's just a little bit crippling, if it's not heavy raining, a baby bag is just enough. It saves so much space in your bag and weight that you don't have to carry. And often, like, you have no, no space to put a tent up in the mountains. Especially if you're, like, above the tree line on a really rocky mountain, you're often very happy to just find a baby spot. All right. Next chapter. Let's switch over to how to shoot motion shots and surf photography. Um, yeah, I grew up in the landlocked area in Austria, full with mountains, but I always was in love with the ocean. And over 17 years ago, I started surfing. So I wouldn't consider myself a surf photographer, but I shoot over 17 years now surfing too. So most of the time, I'm not out there shooting with professional surfers, just with my friends. But however, I think I can give you a few tips on how to start shooting your own surf shots. And a lot of these tips translate into other sports as well. So there are typically two ways of photographing surfing. The first option is you can get into the water and shoot from inside the wave or under it. And the second option is you can shoot from the beach or a nearby pier or even from a boat or if you're lucky on a, from a jet ski. With these options, you most likely use a telephoto lens to shoot from a distance. And in each scenario, you need different equipment and they differ when it comes to composing the image, the focusing the camera and achieving an accurate exposure. 
So from the land, shooting from the land or a boat is always a great place to start. It is also the easiest way to start and it just requires some decent zoom. I would say at least 100 millimeter. So here we see some zoom lenses and yeah, on a boat often uh, 7200 is used, but sure, people use up to 600 millimeter from the lens. And for those really big lenses, I would always recommend a tripod or a monopod. It's just they are heavy and it helps to get your sharp images. And of course you won't buy those images, uh, those lenses immediately, they cost a little fortune, but there is always the option to rent. And remember, if you rent those, always make sure to get the best possible camera with a fast uh, lens with a fast aperture, because they usually have better auto autofocus performance, and that's what you need for shooting surfing. The, the focusing is just faster and more accurate. But if you own already a 7200 or like any 7300, I would just start with that one. If this lens is image stabilized too. It's really great. And it's the same with the camera. You, you don't need the best camera, but yeah, a decent one will help you getting those shots. It would be great to have fast autofocus and a high frame rate. And with high frame rate, I think it's done like five to six images per second, frames per second. But yeah, maybe eight to 10 is ideal. And the faster the frame rate, the higher the chance you capture the critical moments. And when you shoot like in burst mode, you need a fast writing card because otherwise it can be that you wait for your camera saving images when the best wave is coming in. And because your camera is still not ready, it's writing to your card, you're probably not able to take photos. So how, how do I set up my camera? When I shoot surfing from the land, I would say to get sharp images, I set the autofocus to continuous mode so that the camera will continually adjust the focus as the surfer moves towards me. To compose, I put my focus point where I want the surfer to be in the frame and then put that point on the surfer. Um, this really helps me with composing. And always keep in mind the size and the shape the wave as it's a crucial part of the whole image. You don't want to crop the wave. Sure, there are always exceptions, but usually you want to see the whole wave of the surfing there. Um, yeah, when it comes to settings, you want the sh uh, fast shutter speed to freeze the action. So I would recommend at least one thousand of a second, or it's better to have like one two thousand of a second or even faster. And one of the most crucial parts when shooting surfing is the timing. Because you, you have to imagine when you stand on the beach with a big tele lens, um, you need to be really focused. Because there is always distraction anywhere. And this, you, you cannot talk to the surfer like, go now. And you have to watch the surfer and they catch the waves at will. And you need to stay sharp and pay close attention when they go for a wave. Because any slip in your concentration could cost you the best shot of the day. And with big tailor lenses, you, you need to be ready. You need to be looking through the roof viewfinder. And because you need to be ready before the action starts, or you will have to already miss the shot. So the timing is crucial and really a challenge. Um, about composing the shot, no matter where you shoot from, the key thing to keep in mind when composing the image is that you always want more room in front of the surfer than behind them. I mean, sure, there are also exceptions here, but most of the time this is a, a rule of thumb also for other sports photos. And like I said at the beginning, here it helps when you are like an active participant, like when you surf by yourself, you understand better what, what the surfer will do next. You can predict it. But yeah, just experiment and there are no rules. Just when you shoot from the beach, just yeah, move around, switch the angle, go low, 
try to find the foreground and stuff like that. There are really no rules. So yeah, the second option is to shoot in the water. Um, when you have to shoot a lot from, from the land, I bet most of the surf photographers want to try out to shoot in the water. It was the same in my case. I always dreamed of getting yeah into big big waves with my camera actually, and yeah for this you need a waterproof housing with yeah waterproof housing you see it on the right that's me actually and on the mullet dives you need swimming skills luckily me I was in the yeah, swim swimming club for like ten years when I was a kid so I have no problems with this. <laughs> And fins, you need fins to move around in the water because with strong currents and stuff like that, it's yeah essential that you can move around. And optional, sure, you need a wetsuit. Here, luckily, I didn't need a wetsuit because it was warm enough. All right. Um, one second. So, yeah, when you get in the water, this, it requires a, a different skill set than shooting with a beach. It certainly helps if you're a surfer, so you can judge when and where the surfer will be as they come down or across the wave, because you will typically have to swim a fair distance. You need to be a strong swimmer too. And there are some serious techniques involved to get yourself into a wave safely and snapping the shutter as the surfer comes past you. But unfortunately, this can't be taught in a webinar right now. This is just like learning by doing and going out there and going to the water. And you need to know when you need to pull through the back of the wave to stay out of trouble. Obviously, I would recommend you take it easy and improve your skills in smaller sized waves if you are just starting to shoot surfing from the water. Also, watch out for any strong currents or rips that can occur. So, when you're out there and you notice you're being pulled around without control, you you better head in. Let's talk about equipment a little bit in the water. There are a number of surf housing manufacturers. It's it's really hard to find the perfect housing. So many brands are out there. I would suggest you try to have a look at many housings as possible before you buy one, because each housing is specific to the camera model. So you have really to choose them wisely. Me personally, I found that one brand which is just a fair bit cheaper than the rest. And then they call them, they, they call themselves sea frogs. I told you like 10 minutes ago about them and they're from China and they really evolved into a great brand for like people who start out or even for professional photographers I've seen using them. They're just way cheaper and the quality is awesome. So, so I bought my housing from them actually. Um, yeah, what you always need to bring in the water is like a big memory card because you shoot in burst mode and like we are in the water you cannot just change car or anything you out there and yeah, if you change car, usually the session is over. Then there are like two ports. On the left side, we have a flat port. On the right side, you have a dome port. And yeah, both ports have like specific use. Um, I actually like it way better to shoot with a flat port because there you can use lenses from I would say 24 to up to 200 millimeters. I prefer a slightly tailor looking image over a classic fish I shot in surfing. So that's, that's just personal preference. And I feel like it makes me more creative in the water than just like going with the fish eye as close as possible on every shot. Maybe I have just seen too many GoPro images that I think like that, but yeah, it's just my personal, personal thing. Um, yeah, it's important to have your port clean. So on a flat port, 
I use this call this thing called Rainex. So make sure there are no no drops on your port. That's the main thing for a good shot and to get good autofocus. Um, so if you, I mean, it depends. There are like two materials. There is acrylic and glass. And if your port has like the front element is out made of glass, you can really use Rainex. And this is a product which is actually being developed especially for, yeah, to sheet water off car windscreens. So I found this one was working really well with my water housing, but you shouldn't use it on like acrylic boards. Yeah, but maybe that's a little bit too deep for like right now. And with the dome boards, sure. I mean, it's different. There you want to actually have water on the port so you get clean images. You, you want to have a layer of water on there. So the standard technique is just to spit on it or just lick on it like 10 minutes before you enter the water. Then you have that little layer on it. And yeah, you shouldn't have any problems with drops then. How do you shoot in the water? Uh, one, yeah, when using a surf housing, you have to set most of your camera settings before you enter the water, uh, in particular the ISO, unless you have like a housing where you can adjust and on the go. But many housings just don't have many buttons so, or options to do that. But one of my first housings I tried there, I couldn't even switch the camera on and off in the housing. So yeah, you're quite a bit limited, but there's always a way to work around that. And yeah, because it sometimes it's darker inside the wave, I would suggest setting the camera ISO to like something about 400. Or if you have your camera heavy, you can also use auto ISO. So the camera just adjusts the ISO by itself. And I like to use an aperture between F4 to F8 because I just like sometimes the look of small apertures. But yeah, in the water, this doesn't really matter so much. And sure, if you're shooting a fisheye, I would go up to F11 and to get as much depth of field as possible. I usually have my camera in aperture priority mode so that the aperture stays fixed. And I use the appropriate ISO setting to make sure that the shutter speed is fast enough to, to, yeah, to freeze the motion. And some cameras allow to setting up a minimum shutter speed when using auto ISO. If yours has that feature, I would highly recommend it. Um, yeah, I mean, if you have questions or any, anything about how shooting, like what I bring you here right now, just type in the questions in the chat and I will go and look through them after the presentation. What do I use for focusing? I mostly use AFC, which is, yeah, continuous focus. But it always, yeah, it depends on the on the situation. Often, if yeah, if the surface is coming towards you, it's really good. But if the surface is just like parallel to you and just surfing by you, they often use also single shot focusing. But what I always use is like one spot fo uh, a spot focus point, which I put like a little bit up from the middle. Because if you use wide focus, the camera is just grabbing anything and maybe it just grabs the water in front of you and not the surfer, which is more in the back. Yeah, and with downboard, yeah, downboards you usually, you shoot with pretty wide lenses. So you have a pretty small window in your photos is going to look good generally with the wave when the wave is really close to you. So it's really small window. So when you shoot surfing, you keep the dome under the water and, and wait until the second before you want to take the photo. And then you pull it up and yeah, you pull it up and most of the water sheets off the dome and do fire your shots. That's the technique. So you always wait with the whole camera equipment underwater. And when you see, oh, now, now I'm ready. Now the surface is close enough pull it up and yeah, shoot your images. I have to say I don't use the downboard really often because I just don't like the look 
very much. But to, uh, for example, when you want to get like super good split shots underwater over water, this is probably the best method, the best gear to use. And sure, when you don't have too much time, too much, uh, too much distance between you and the subject, like when I was shooting with the orcas in Norway, and I was like close to one or two meters to the orca. Sure, you want to have a wide lens to get the whole animal in frame. That's where the dome board is coming in really handy too. And like from the land, you need a fast shutter speed. And yeah, there's it's, it's the same here. You can experiment a lot in the water. You can even with fins, you can move past the surfer behind him, switch, yeah. Switch your direction where you shoot from and everything. But yeah, it, it's it's up to you what you make when you have like when you have your camera set up. I would not stay a whole session in the, in the same place in the water. I would always suggest to move around, maybe even swim to the surface, take some portraits, try to split some underwater over water images. And yeah. Like like I said in the beginning with the first the first images I showed you, try maybe tell a little story just from that session. All right. Now, I want to tell you some experiences with the new BenQ SW321C. Um, BenQ was so nice and sent me the monitor so I could test it out. Yeah, so this is actually a 32 inch 4K monitor. And uh, to be honest, it blew me away. <laughs> we as photographers have spent quite some money on cameras, lenses, accessories, and quite some time to go out and capturing our images. But let's face it, with a bad quality monitor, it was almost a waste of time and money because if we go out, if we go on to the edit on a bad monitor, the colors will be inaccurate and often without knowing it, your images end up looking completely different than what you intend. Honestly, until BenQ sent me the monitor, I was always relying on my MacBook screen, which I was using with a Samsung HD monitor and I never trusted the Samsung monitor for colors though. It was just too old, so I relied on my MacBook and it did an okay job, but now with the with the BenQ SW321C, I, I see a whole new world in my images actually. A whole new world up and opened up on me. Now with the 4K monitor, which is by the way, four times the resolution of HD, my images look way more crisp and I can see much more of the small details. I was pretty wild the first time I was going through my portfolio and on the bank you for me it was definitely an aha moment and yeah my mind was blown <clears throat> you will find tons of written reviews and, and review videos on youtube about that monitor but yeah they go into all the details but i thought i will just show you a few fe favorite features where i think they come in really handy so the first thing is the matte and net finish and the IPS band. I instantly noticed just how matte the screen is. It, it does such a great job of minimizing reflections and glare. It is perfectly diffusing light, which is coming from my environment. And this in combination with the IPS panel makes this monitor for me the perfect tool to view, select and fit a ton of photos without making my eyes tired. And IPS actually stands for in-plane switching. And this is a technology that helps you getting a more constant view from your from different angles with any significant contrast or color shifts. So in short, you get much more constant, a much more constant look with an IPS display. It ensures uniform viewing for multiple people in the room. So for me, it's perfect to show my work to friends or to a client. And the next cool thing is that the monitor arrives pre-calibrated. Pre so every SW321 
3.2.1c comes pre-calibrated with the unit color report right out of the box. So I think this is awesome because you can just start working immediately and you know that you're going to see the, the right colors. That's that's really a huge thing for me. And as every monitor over time, every display loses color. And that's why it is super great to have a monitor which is like compatible with hardware calibration. Of course, you can always do a software calibration, but hardware calibration is just far superior and ensures much greater color precision. So this monitor lets you recalibrate it from time to time to ensure the colors stay correct. Then we have like a white gamut space. What does that mean? <laughs> so our monitor must be able to reproduce as many colors as possible. And this capacity is defined by the so-called gamut. For a photographer, it is not only essential that the monitor covers the sRGB color space, essentially for our online publications, but it must be able to cover as much as possible of the Adobe RGB color space in order to allow us to manage printing as well. And with the BenQ, we get like 100% sRGB and 99% Adobe RGB color space coverage. And this is awesome. This is perfect so you can make sure your images look look the same online and in print. Um, yeah, there is the free software called Palette Master Element and this comes free with every BenQ. You can just download it on the website or you can look up some YouTube videos on it and it's super easy to calibrate your monitor. I personally use like a Spider X monitor calibration tool and yeah, it's just takes a few minutes and makes sure that I really see the right colors. So the next and the last feature I really like of the monitor is the paper sync, the paper color sync. <clears throat> this is extremely useful for every photographer who enjoys printing, either to print by yourself or in the lab. This will be so much helpful. Basically, they developed and the monitor not only for those who like to publish them online, but especially for those who love to print without wasting time and money. Because you don't have to do many hard proofs anymore. And yeah, two main factors make this possible. The matte finish, which I mentioned before, it reduces glare and gives the pen less light matte look. And this look helps to simulate the effect of a photographic paper and is the first step in color, color accuracy for printing purposes. And then BenQ's own paper color sync technology, which eliminates the difference in color and contrast between monitor and print. I know that sounds crazy, but in other words, the printed image will look like the totally same like on the monitor. So the free software lets you put, lets you input the printer model and you type in the paper and the color space and then you hit the button and once the configuration is done the color mode of the monitor will switch to paper color sync mode and yeah there you go now you can just edit in your lightroom or your adobe and just get the look you want to get on the print and yeah it's similar but it's it's more accurate than soft proving in adobe lightroom so Overall, the SW321C is a great piece of kit and it's definitely the best monitor I've ever used. But the monitor is not going to make your photography any better, only your knowledge is and your, how often you practice and yeah, it's how much passion do you put into it. But what's the point of putting all the hours in and using a top-notch camera when the files are treated on a monitor with big color issues. There is no point because then I can just buy the cheapest monitor and yeah. But yeah, with this monitor, you are getting for sure extra color, extra detail and much more space when viewing your photography. That was a huge aha moment too for me. That's how much space is there to edit <laughs> coming from a MacBook. And you are also getting an easy way to view your 
pictures in different color spaces. And these are things that don't come with many monitors. So I'm, I'm really happy with it, yeah. All right, now it's Q&A time. So thanks everyone for your time. And I will go and have a look at your questions now and try to answer them. I'm turning the camera on again so you can see me. All right, let's see. A question from Francesco. How do you get an assignment? I mean, where do you take jobs from? Newspaper or brand? How do you find it? Especially newspaper or magazine. How do you prepare the assignments? I mean, do you use the present to present some imaginary preview to the customer about the assignments or just showing a portfolio? All right. Um, how do I get assignments? Um, it's it's two ways. So once I get approached just because somebody saw my images, but at the beginning it was not like that. I was just like starting out and I tried to shoot a portfolio in my free time. And sure, I was like reaching out to a ton of brands and to all the magazines I know and just, yeah, sent them my portfolio. And if they didn't answer, I often just send it again and I reached out to them again. I even called some of them to ask if they got my email. I mean, you have, really have to, yeah, you have to put in the work too. Um, how do I prepare for an assignment? Yeah, usually, if you get an assignment, you get a job, you get a briefing. And with this briefing, there is they have listed what what kind of shots they need, what they need 100%, what would be nice to have, and what like um, what emotions and what vibes they want to translate. And yeah, that's, that's how you prepare you. I make my list, what shots I do I need. I have it on my phone and outdoors, I, when the light is right and when everything lines up, I try to get as many different shots as possible. Yeah, I mean, like you said, it's I show my portfolio to the customer and often the customer knows my portfolio because when they approach me, they have seen my Instagram or my, yeah, my portfolio online. I hope it helps. Um, other than the website and Instagram, what other ways do you recommend to get your photos viewed and sold? Um, that's a good question. I don't actually don't sell many images. Like if you mean prints, sure, I have a little print shop here and there, but I don't sell many images. People just don't buy many prints, at least with mine. But when it comes to like paid jobs for brands and stuff, for me, the, the best business card out there is actually Instagram. I mean, everybody is like, Contacting, contacting me there. But I also have like, I work with an agent company in Germany and there I have like a printed portfolio and my agent is going from agency to agency and show, showing them my images as well. So this really helps. Um, I don't know, website and Instagram, I mean, we are in a digital age. You have to have those two. Sure, you can always, like like I said, if you want to have your images in, 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 in magazines or newspapers, you have to contact them. You have to, yeah, you have to contact them open, like three times a week and just send them your new stuff and send them. Maybe magazines love to have like words too. So write a little, a little text about your story right? What have you done? Why have you done it? And just suggest and just pitch projects to everyone out there. Well, which camera housing do you use for your underwater shots? Um, actually, I use different water housings. I have used the Aquatech, but wasn't really happy with those. Then 
I was shooting with Olympus cameras for a time. I have used their housing, which was actually pretty poor because on the Olympus you can just, it's like having, you have every option, you have, you can use every, every button on the camera with the housing. So I really tried that one. And like I said, with the RX100, I was using the brand Seafrox and I highly recommend those because they are cheap and they are good. And they're perfect for stars, I guess. I, like I said, I wait until the A9 Mark III is coming out and then I will get a new housing for this camera and it will be a Seafrox for sure. Do you ever use your smartphone to take photos? Yes, I do every day. It's the camera I have with me on like any time I do photos, but sure, I mostly will not not use those images for like client work. That's, otherwise I shoot for like Samsung, which is a partner of mine and they want me to shoot with, with the phone, then sure I do. But, so I, I document my life with my phone like everyone does, I guess. And, and I'm super happy that I have it with me because so many memories are yeah, captured with this little camera. What are your thoughts on presets? Um, yeah, presets are a cool thing. I, I use presets too, but it, it makes my workflow faster and I can, yeah, I can edit my images faster. So I, I would never start with a clean image. I always start with like my basic preset I use on, I have maybe a three or four basic presets I know I'm gonna switch through every now and then. But yeah, they make everything faster. Uh, I'm not the guy who is selling his presets. I'm not a fan of buying presets from other people and make my, my work look the same as their work. And that's not just me, but I mean, I mean many people are successful with that. And if you like it there, you know, there are no rules with photography. And in the end, the image, the outcome is that what is counting. And if you have that sick preset seen online from somebody and you want to buy it, maybe, yeah, just do it. But like I said, try to find, to, and try to develop your own style. And that includes, of course, the editing as well. What else do we have here from Robert? Hi, Roman, really interesting talk. Thanks. How did you create a beautiful pool of light on and in front of the climber? <laughs> um, in the orange jacket on top of the mountain. I, I didn't create, nature did create that. I just captured it actually. I mean, yeah, often if you shoot like into the sun, maybe make it like if the sun is not directly facing your lens so maybe it's coming a little bit from the left or from the right and then you get often some kind of bloom or glowy feel of the image that's what i often do with my tele lens maybe that's what you mean on that shot but otherwise this was just a really nice sunset up there and i was just asking Stephanie, stay stay a little bit i want to take images it looks awesome so maybe that helps. Yeah, maybe just try to, to yeah, find a few angles with the camera. And sometimes you get like a really gloomy look. Florian, could you please repeat the brand name of the water resistant camera housing? Uh, maybe you need sea frogs. Yeah, they call it sea frogs from China. There are many brands, but this is the brand I was talking about. And yeah, if you type it in, in Google, you will find the website immediately. Um, all right, guys, I think now we don't have time for more questions, but you could ask people to reach out. Um, yeah, we have no time for more questions, but you can always reach out on Instagram and ask me more or just drop me an email. And I thank you for being part of this presentation and for your questions and for like spending your time with me. And I hope you learned something. 
and until next time thanks everyone bye bye